I want to uh, welcome you all. I know that many of you know me, especially here, it's kind of a hardcore. But for those I have not met, I'm Bill Cahoy, and I have the honor of being Dean of the School of Theology and Seminary here at St. John's. And I want to welcome you this evening, and thank you for braving the elements and coming out. We have uh, a few no-shows, but uh, a quality audience, much better. Thank you. This is the first in a series of events on the Second Vatican Council. The Council met in four sessions each fall from 1962 to 1965. So 2012 to 2015 marks the 50th anniversary of that Council. We're using this anniversary as an occasion for continued reflection on the Council, its meaning, its impact over the last half century, its likely future trajectories, its implementation, and the connection of all of this to St. John's. Over the next two and a half years, once a semester, we'll have major events like this organized around the major constitutions of the Council and the decree on ecumenism. The next, and you'll hear more about this, but the next one is March 27th. Bishop Dennis Madden will be our speaker. Bishop Madden is the president of the Bishop's Committee on Ecumenism and Interreligious Dialogue, and he'll be speaking on the Constitution Lumen Gentium on the nature of the church. But now, it is my pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Father Anthony Ruff, Professor of Liturgy, Director of the Diekman Center, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Enjoy. Dr. Massimo Fagioli studied in Italy in Bologna and Turin with his doctorate from the University of Turin in 2002. His research specialties are in the history of Christianity, the Second Vatican Council, and religion and politics. Dr. Fagioli is widely published with an unbelievably long CV of, of articles and publications, including two important books, Vatican II, The Battle for Meaning from Paulist Press in 2012, and True Reform, Liturgy and Ecclesiology in Sacrosanctum Concilium from our liturgical press, also 2012. He has taught at universities in Italy, and now he is assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas, that fine Catholic university whom our football team beat this year. <laughs> 20 to 18. Tonight's event is being live broadcast at the School of Theology Seminary website and will soon be available for archive viewing. So we greet also our internet viewers tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Massimo Fagioli, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Ecumenical Dialogue and Engagement with the World. Good evening, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I braved myself the elements this morning, so I know what it means. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to read not too much into the uh, fact that this note may be a sign that a, th a St. Thomas professor shouldn't be here, but, uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's, yeah. Um, I'm really thankful to, uh, to my friends here at St. John's, at the College of the Institute, at the Digital Press. Uh, I have to say uh, here to Anthony Ruff, to Hans, uh, to Barry, to the Digital Press that they have done uh, much more for the liturgy uh, than uh, I have done, and they have done much more for me uh, than what I've done for them. So that's, that's uh, an act of appreciation, my being here, and a great uh, honor. The 50th anniversary of Vatican II is being celebrated in a very particular and unexpected way. One of the reasons is the extraordinary transition for its 
institutional and theological consequences from Benedict XVI to Pope Francis almost nine months ago. But there is a relationship between what happened in the Vatican at the beginning of 2013 and the world of theology, and it has to do with Vatican II. One of the many fruits of these last few years of theological studies in the Catholic Church, and one of the results of the anniversary of the, of the Council is the awareness that the liturgical constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium is not only the first constitution approved by, by Vatican II at the end of the second session, but it is also the key, or as Jesuit theologian Christoph Theobald recently de described it, la porte, that is the gateway to the whole of Vatican II. The debates around the liturgical issues in these last 10 years at, at least, especially the translation of liturgical texts, and Benedict XVI's motu proprio of 2007 on the extraordinary rite, all these debates show the profound relationship between the conception of the liturgy and the assessment of the, on the liturgical reform on one side, and on the other side, the, I, the very idea of the church. The second key acquisition in the recent debate on Vatican II, also thanks to the debate on the liturgical constitution, is the importance of the intertextuality and the intratextuality of a correct hermeneutical approach to Vatican II, together with the need to put the council documents in their historical contexts. Without these elements, Vatican II can say too much or too little, but for sure it is not intelligible. This is why understanding the liturgical reform cannot avoid facing the most characteristic element of Vatican II, that is, its opening ad extra to the ecumenical world and to the world to cure. These two dimensions are intertwined and they are part directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, of every assessment of Vatican II and of the liturgical reform. In the first part of my lecture, I, I will try to assess some of the ecumenical elements of the debate on the liturgical constitution during Vatican II and the relationship between liturgical re, uh, reform and ecumenism after, after Vatican II. In the second part, I intend to explore the issue of the relationship between the liturgical constitution and the idea of the world and modern culture at Vatican II. Finally, I will offer a few insights on the state of the art of the contribution of the liturgy to the understanding of the world in the post-Vatican II church and ask a few questions that are key to, to the reception of Vatican II. <clears throat> In my book, True Reform, published last year, I pointed out the consequences of the liturgical reform for the ecumenical dimension of the Catholic Church, e initiating with the debates at Vatican II and the very final text of uh, the Sacrosanctum Concilium. The method used by my book was, in other words, in medias res, that is, without giving details on the origins of the ecumenical spirit of the liturgical constitution. The, the book started from the assumption expressed by the words of the French ecumenist Paul Couturier that the liturgical reform is the necessary companion of the ecumenical turn of the Catholic Church. In Couturier's words, l'un est l'aboutiment de l'autre. One is the outcome of the other. Theological ressourcement on one side and the further development of the ecclesiology of Pius XII Mystici Corporis on the other played a major role in making the liturgical constitution able to express the image of the church in ecumenical terms. The ecumenical dimension of the liturgical debate was not a secondary part of the liturgical reform of Vatican II and the participation of ecumenical observers invited at the council to the theological and liturgical dimension of, uh, of the council is a key feature for understanding the relationship 
between liturgical reform and rapprochement. Nevertheless, it is now worth, it, it, it is now worth focusing more on the ecumenical roots of Sacrosanctum Concilium in the prehistory of the Constitution in order to understand the accomplishments of the liturgical constitution and of Vatican II. This is important also be, because since Vatican II, many Catholics, especially but not only in the United States, have been accustomed to think of reform as signifying a renewed awareness of the social dimension of the faith and to assume that this awareness will naturally have progressive or reformist political consequences. That is not necessarily always the case. In fact, there are also discontinuities between the pre-Vatican II liturgical movement and Vatican II, especially about the ecclesiology of the liturgical movement and its views of the world. For example, some of the protagonists of the pre-World War II and pre-Vatican II liturgical movement, especially in European countries under fascism, like Italy and Germany, these protagonists, some of them, advocated a restored communal, communal and corporate sense of the church as the body of Christ. Sometimes their communal and anti-individualistic views bordered clearly with fascism and, and Nazism which were considered the conveyors of this new anti-liberal and new communal Catholicism. In other words, some of the pre-Vatican II reformers did not have an ecumenical view of the liturgical reform. On the other hand, the cases of Don Lambert Baudouin and of Virgin Michael are, are quite different. In Don Lambert Baudouin, there is from the beginning an ecumenical theology that is an integral part of his ecumenical movement, different from the, the calls for the return of non-Catholics to Rome, even though that ecumenical aspiration was still encompassed in, in an ecclesiology of the mystical body. Virgil Michael's work in, in the liturgical movement became part of, he, of his ecumenical engagement especially during the final years of his life. It is therefore clear that these very different cases in the world of the pre-Vatican II liturgical movement must be for us the reminder that the relationship between the liturgical movement and the political cultures or the zeitgeist is far from simple and sometimes still obfuscated by the incorrect assumption about the obvious and natural progressive or liberal character of some theological ideas. Secondly, the liturgical movement at the Second Vatican Council becomes something different than the one of previous generations because it is in touch with Vatican II as ideas expressed in documents and as an event. And it, it comes after World War II. And the new awareness of the limitations and of the consequences of a Catholic social doctrine focused on Pius XI, the, the idea of the social reign of Christ. The major difference from a theological point of, of, of view is exactly a more ecumenical ecclesiology. Here we see that one of the major elements of the liturgical issue at Vatican II is the confluence at the Council of the culture of the liturgical movement and of a new ecumenical ecclesiology that permeates the whole of Vatican II. We must not take the ecumenical turn of the, ecumen of the liturgical movement in, in the preparation and in the celebration of Vatican II as an obvious fact. On the contrary, in the few decades between World War I and Vatican II, the unionist movement in the Catholic Church, the one that advocated the return of non-Catholics to Rome and the absorption of non-Catholic churches into the fold of Roman Catholicism, that unionist movement had been quite successful from a unionist standpoint, 
with a rising number of conversions, especially after World War II, and especially in countries like Germany, in the Netherlands, England, and the United States. The ecumenical turn that involved the liturgical debate at Vatican II involves also different actors. On one side, the vota of the bishops sent to Rome in 1960 for the, for the preparation of the council did mention the need for, for liturgical reform as one of the top priorities, but these bishops, especially European bishops, did not always link it with the ecumenical issue. The preparatory schema of the liturgical commission contained reforms with great ecumenical potential, but ecumenism as such was more in the backdrop than in the text prepared by the commission and finalized between November 1961 and February 1962. The decisive contribution to the ecumenical turn of the liturgical debate at Vatican II came from the Secretariat for Christian Unity, the most important institutional innovation decided for Vatican II by Pope John. That Secretariat that was led by Jesuit German Cardinal Augustin Bea. Since the end of 1960, the Secretariat started working at the liturgical side of the ecumenical issue, especially thanks to the input coming from three of the 15 consultors of the Secretariat since February 1961. Monsignor Francis Davis of Birmingham and theologians Gregory Baum and George Tavard. In April 1961, the work of the Secretariat on Ecumenism and Liturgy becomes part of a mixed commission with members of the Liturgical Preparatory Commission. And the main issues were first the language of uh, the liturgy, the role of, of scripture vis-a-vis -vis de devotions, communion under both species, co-celebration and, and communicatio in sacris. However, the report of the commission of January 1961 that has been published recently in one of the volumes of the John, uh, the 23rd Foundation in Bologna, that report of January 1961 did what the preparatory commission on the liturgy did not do. That is, it began from a general assumption of, on the ecumenical relevance of the liturgy. That report of January 1961 was organized in two parts. In the first part, general observations, and the second part, conclusions. In the first part, the Secretariat focused on the ecumenical relevance of the active participation, the role of scripture in the liturgy, the liturgical language, and concelebration and rebaptism. In the conclusion of the report signed by the Archbishop of Rouen in France, Joseph Marie Martin, encouraged the undertaking of the liturgical reforms with ecumenical relevance that would become part of Sacrosanctum Concilium later. Regarding the ecumenical issue, the report of January 1961 explicitly said, and I quote, there is no doubt that the liturgical issues are at the center of ecumenical dialogue. The issue of the liturgical language especially if is of great importance from the point of view of different categories of separated brothers and sisters, end quote. But the ecumenical turn in liturgical issues was not universally accepted in the preparation of the Second Vatican Council. In the spring of 1961, in a critical moment of the preparatory phase of Vatican II, the Secretariat for Christian Unity reacted to an article published anonymously but authoritatively with the dreaded three-star signature in the Osservatore Romano on March 25, 1961, in which liturgical Latin was defended because of the need for a liturgical language that was, I quote, universal, immutable, and not vulgar, end quote. 
the votum of the Secretariat for, for Christian Unity, a few days later, was a clear response to that article in the Sovete Romano. And I quote, that the council, when it presents the principles of liturgical renewal, carefully refrain from any expression which might suggest that the Catholic liturgy is identified with the Latin Roman liturgy and that the Latin language is a necessary bond of Catholic unity." End quote. In other words, the contribution of the Secretariat for Ecumenism is inseparable from the contribution given by the ecumenical observers at the Council. Their presence was key for the growth of the ecumenical character of the liturgical constitution, as well as for many other documents. As we can see from the reception of, of Sacrosanctum Concilium, in many observers at Vatican II, the role of the liturgical reform cannot be minimized if we want to look at the ecumenical reception of the council. The bridging role between East and West played by figures like Pierre Dupré is part of the history of the relationship between liturgy and ecumenism at Vatican II. The role of the liturgy and Eucharistic ecclesiology in paving the ecumenical way were emphasized in the debate later in 62 and 63 on the liturgical constitution. As Keith Pecklers wrote, and I quote, one of the best gifts of the conciliar liturgical renewal was its ecumenical consciousness that had not been so acutely present in the years that preceded it, end quote. The history of this relationship between the, uh, the representatives of the ecumenical movement and the liturgical debate at Vatican II would require a whole new research. But I think that what is important to, uh, uh, to remember here is that first, Ecumenism became part of the liturgical debate not only because of the origins of the liturgical movement, but also because of the Secretariat for Ecumenism and of their perception as ecumenists of the relevance of the liturgical issue for the ecumenical future of the Catholic Church. Second, the connection between the liturgical reform and ecumenism is part of the history of Vatican II, and therefore must be part of the hermeneutics, both of the liturgical constitution and of the decree on ecumenism, even though Unitatis et Integratio does not quote Sacrosanto Concilium directly. In the conclusion of his, of his recent book, 2009, on the achievements of the ecumenical dialogues in these last few years, harvesting the fruits, Cardinal Casper uh, affirms a very important thing, I, I think, and I quote, we have rediscovered the centrality of the, of the liturgy, especially the liturgy of the Eucharist as source and summit of the church. Through the biblical idea of anamnesis, memoria, Ecumenical dialogue has unveiled new perspectives of understanding. The same is true in the rediscovery of the importance of the epiclesis, and thereby of the Holy Spirit as the main agent in the liturgy of the Eucharist and of all sacraments. All this is the more important because it leads us to hope that in the future, whether near or remote is not ours to determine, we may together celebrate the Eucharist as the sign of full communion, end quote. On the other hand, David Holleton said already in 2008 that uh, due to the, the Vatican document Liturgiam Authenticam of 2001, I quote, the Catholic Church is at risk of losing its preeminent role in the liturgical reforms of the churches of the Western tradition, and that would be tragic." End quote. Vatican II cannot be understood and explained, especially to the young generation of Catholics and to the ones who never heard of the Council of Pope John before, 
without the fundamental call to a new unity that the Pope expressed in his calling of the Second Vatican Council, a new ecumenical unity. Roncalli was clear about that already in 1954 as a new patriarch of Venice. In October 1954, in, in a lecture given during the International U Eucharistic Congress in Lebanon, Roncalli spoke about a, a ecumenism as the task, quote, of rebuilding Catholicity in its amplitude and perfection, the most important event in modern times, 1954, end quote. There is the ecumenical side of the ad extra, of the liturgical reform. There is also the other side of the call of Vatican II ad extra, and that is the new relationship between the church and the modern world, or the church in the modern world. In these last three decades, the interpretation of the texts and the event of Vatican II has divided theologians in different camps. The most fruitful way to describe them and their differences is, in my opinion, according to an ecclesiological criterion that is dividing them between neo-Augustinians and neo-Thomists. This theological but also political phenomenon that is more visible in American Catholicism more than other Catholic cultures around the world has sometimes overshadowed the fact that Vatican II represents a real shift in the ecclesiological formulation of the role of the world for the Catholic Church. But sometimes as if this turn happened only for Neotomists and it never happened for Neogostinians. Nevertheless, here there is a real substantial difference between the relationship liturgy ecumenism on one side and on the other side the relationship between the liturgical debate and the ecclesiological debate on the church in the modern world. Why? Whereas the liturgical debate received a substantial contribution from the observers and ecumenists at the Vatican II, since the preparation uh, that is between 1960 and 1962, there is an evident chronological gap between uh, the debate and the approval of the liturgical constitution at the end of 1963, and the debate and approval of Gaudium et Spes, uh, the constitution on the church uh, in the modern world, that happens only in the final weeks of Vatican II at the end of 1965. That means these two debates happen in two different phases of the Second Vatican Council, under two different popes, and in two different ecclesial conditions. That means that this relationship is different from the relationship ecumenism liturgy. The relationship between the liturgical constitution and, and the documents ad extra and Gaudium et Spes especially requires therefore an approach to Vatican II that is more organic, a body of texts that express a fundamental coherence also in absentia when we don't have direct citations of these different documents. But it is clear that one of the main aims of the council announced by Pope John was to summon the, uh, the church and celebrate its unity in a new relationship with the outer world, as we can read in the Apostolic Constitution Humanae Salutis of uh, December 25, 1961. The same emphasis on unity was also a light motif in Pope John's opening speech of the Council, Gauted Mater Ecclesia of October 11, 1962, in which Pope John explained the threefold importance of unity for Vatican II, and I quote, indeed, if one considers well this same unity which Christ implored for his church, 
it seems to shine, as it were, with a triple ray of beneficent supernal light. Namely, first, the unity of Catholics among themselves, which must always be kept exemplary and most firm. Second, the unity of prayers and ardent desires with which those Christians separated from this apostolic see aspire to be united with us. And three, the unity in esteem and respect for the Catholic Church which animates those who follow non-Christian religions. 1962, end quote. Vatican II continued the tradition of a unity expressed through liturgy, but it did so through an understanding of rapprochement, of reapproaching, reaching out, reconciliation, that expressed more clearly the attempt of Vatican II to make the, ch of the church a sacrament of reconciliation for humankind. The idea of rapprochement a term that is used many times by Dom, Lambert, Dom Lambert Baudouin, the pioneer of ecumenism, is not part, so this, this term, rapprochement, is not part of the corpus of the Second Vatican Council in a material way, but it belongs fully to the aims of Vatican II. The main rapprochement carried out by Sacrosanto Concilium consists of a reconciled and unifying vision of the church, of Christian life, of the existential condition of the faithful in the world, and of the coexistence between church and world. Far from being a purely aesthetical option, the theological starting point of the liturgical reform aimed at resetting the relationship between Christian liturgy, the spiritual needs of the faithful, and the Catholic theological reading of the modern world in its historical and social dimensions. The rapprochement expressed by the liturgical constitution was one of the first, if partially unconscious, acts of moving beyond the negative Weltanschauung, this view of the world that was marked in the Catholic intellectual world by the French Revolution and prolonged through the 19th and the first half of the 20th century. That is why, in my opinion, the forms of the liturgical celebration are not indifferent to the world in which the contemporary church lives. As shown by recent reactions to the schism of Lefebvre, who refused to recognize Vatican II, it is evident, even for observers apparently more distant from the world church, non-Catholic churches, Jewish communities, that there is a direct link between forms of the liturgy, theological cultural reference, and worldview. The theological content of the liturgical constitution, especially Sacrosanctum Concilium 5, 6, and 8, has intertextual connections with other council documents, especially Dei Verbum and Nostetate, that are crucial for the overall theological balance of Vatican II. However, the fundamental move of the liturgical constitution in the direction of rapprochement in the church consists in stressing the nature of the church as an extension of the mission of Jesus Christ. Here we have the connection between ecclesiology and Christology in the Constitution. Giving centrality back to the liturgy means restoring in a theological transparent way the understanding of the relationship between church and liturgy and giving way to the liturgy as a rapprochement to its real center. The liturgy being the line of continuation between the time of the church and the, and the time of Christ. Liturgy is the ultimate source of, rep, of rapprochement in the church because it stresses the nature of the celebration as the time and place for a community, not for a sum of individuals. It is a community that meets Christ in the Eucharist. 
in this sense, the liturgical reform of the, of the council made a clear option for putting to an end the class-based legacy of Christendom when liturgy mirrored not only the culture of dominant Catholicism, but also, show, also social and status differences between the wealthy and the poor, thus legitimizing and justifying the different roles played in the church by the wealthy and the, and the poor in a number of, of issues. But along with these communitarian sensibilities, the liturgical constitution also stresses the importance of the unity of the local church through liturgy, which is not seen as a closed door performance for initiated people to be staged in a pseudo-sectarian setting. Besides the technical content of the liturgical reform, this drive for a rapprochement in the church and for a rapprochement made possible through the church is one of the most fundamental features of the epoch-making shift of, Matic, of the Second Vatican Council. John O'Malley's insights about the style of Vatican II proved to be of the utmost importance for understanding the rapprochement expressed by the liturgical constitution. From the very beginning of Sacro Santo Concilium, Vatican II expresses in its language the desire for a rapprochement. And I, I quote here a few expressions that are in, 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 in the first eight lines. As set out, adapt, promote union, strengthen whatever can help to call all mankind into the church's fold, expresses and manifests to others the mystery of Christ. These are the, the first words of the liturgical constitution, which was the first document to be debated, voted on, and approved by Vatican II after the message to the world that expressed the determination of the council to be heedful to the world. And I quote from the message to uh, the world of October the 20th, 1962. We urgently turn our thoughts to all the anxieties by which human beings are afflicted today, end quote. And of course, Gaudium Espes will uh, pick up that, uh, uh, that motive of the anxieties of, uh, of the world that are part of the, of the anxieties of the church. And chapter five of Sacrosanto Concilium, for example, abandons the spirit of the, of the Reconquista typical of medieval Christendom and fosters rapprochement through a narrative of God's will for a truly universal salvation, which does not exclude any category or area of humankind from the gift and mercy given by God. Vatican II took seriously the pastoral nature of itself in reorienting Catholic theology towards the world as it is, in its concrete, historical, and social aspects. In this, though, a complicating factor is that the world of today is obviously very different from the world of 1962-65. It's clear that the world has changed in the 50 years after Vatican II, much more than in the 50 years after the Council of Trent. And much of the, of the debate around Vatican II and the liturgical constitution is actually also an historical political debate. In very simple terms, the question concerns the moral character of the arc of history in these last 50 years. So we're good 50 years or bad 50 years. However, there is at least one issue that constitutes, in my opinion, part of the path forward in understanding and implementing the liturgical constitution, one of, of the open problems, and it has to do with the role of culture. 
If we want to understand the importance of the liturgical reform of Vatican II for what it says about the world, we must also take an honest look at the differences between different documents. Here again, this research would, would, would require a thorough analysis of the debates shaping the different documents and the vocabulary used in those debates. But there is one element that stands out because of its relevance in the contemporary theological debate around Vatican II in the Catholic Church. That is the role of culture and the stance of the Council concerning culture. It is another way of looking at the vexata questio of the cultural and or countercultural nature of the Second Vatican Council and of the Church. It is undeniable here that something happened after Vatican II in the relationship between Catholicism and culture that had profound consequences in the general balance of the relationship church and modern world. Two years before Gadium et Spes, which was approved at the end of 1965, in Sacrosanto Concilium, between 1962 and 63, we have already an idea of culture that is, if compared with Gadium et Spes, non-dialectical or non-adversarial or less countercultural than in Gadium et Spes, and clearly much less adversarial or pessimistic, looking at modern culture than most of the post-Vatican II magisterium. In other words, the liturgical constitution assumes a cultural form that is given and an alignment between culture and liturgy, with consequences that are very important for the idea of enculturation, but not only. Recently, German liturgists, uh, Benedict Kranemann and Albert Gerhards, spoke of a kultur optimismus, of a cultural optimism of the liturgical constitution. In, in the words of Kranemann, I, I quote, the liturgy constitution proceeds from a society that is strongly marked by an ecclesiastical and Christian culture, end quote. This cultur optimismus, this cultural optimism of the early phase of Vatican II is an, an essential element if we want to frame correctly the debate about Vatican II, enculturation, inclusion, exclusion, and liturgy. In an essay published two years ago in German, Cardinal of Mechelen Brussels, Godfrey Daniels, asked a very direct question concerning the issue of enculturation and incarnation of the Christian message in the relation to the debate on the liturgical language. And that is the quote from Daniels. In fact, there is still in front of us the question whether we are facing a radical cultural change and whether this will also have religious implications." End quote. In other words, if the history of Vatican II in these last 50 years brought about a radical cultural change from the one of the early 1960s, we have to rethink the relationship between liturgy and culture. German systematician Peter Hundermann has worked on the idea of culture as a locus theologicus for the Church of Vatican II in his new list of Loci Alieni that takes seriously the turn of theology from a philosophical neo-scholastic system to a theological frame of mind that is not separable from the historical form of the faith. His reflection published 10 years ago in his book uh, Dogmatische Principien Lehre, it becomes once again re relevant today in this e ecclesial moment when, among other things, the clear retrieval of, by Pope Francis of Pope Paul VI's idea of mission 
and evangelization, especially in Evangelii Nunziandi, means a rediscovery of the relevance of culture as the context for, for evangelization. To be very blunt, this could be quite a change from recent times. During the years before Pope Francis, sometimes counterculturalism had become a separate comfort zone culture and had taken the shape of the culture of a Catholic clergy of a kind of conformism of anti-conformism. It had become sometimes the mystique of a bloodless martyrdom where a certain liberal naive complacency towards the illusion of unlimited progress was matched in some Catholic quarters by the illusion of a counterculture as a reaction against culture, but also a, a, against knowledge, against awareness of the issues and problems of the real world. It is therefore no surprise that sometimes a certain proud ignorance has become part of the theological counterculturalism, which is also part of an anti-Vatican II reaction. The disastrous consequences of this attitude for the ability of the church to evangelize and be missionary in the modern world are easy to imagine. If this refusal to articulate carefully and wisely the cultural, countercultural identity of the, of, the, of the church starts with the liturgical life of the, of the, of the church, in this case, the consequences, I think, are even more serious theologically and pastorally. The countercultural mystique is often associated with a clerical culture that assumes, again, the medieval ideology of the duo genera Christianorum, two kinds of Christians, clergy on one side and lay people on the other side. This has vast consequences for, for ecclesiology, but especially for the very idea of the relationship between the church and the modern world and for the ability of the church to be faithful to the call of Vatican II for the church to act as a sacrament of reconciliation of the world to God. Counterculturalism in very clear terms entails also a clear minimization of the role of others in our understanding of liturgy. A theologian from Czechoslovakia, Thomas Halik, spoke of the need of, for the church to look at what he calls in German, Zacchaeus mention. Those who look at the, uh, uh, the church as Zacchaeus looked at Jesus in, in the Gospels, that is from a distance and from the outside. The relationship between liturgy and the world is greatly affected by our understanding of the culture and counterculture and of others. The consequences have to do with the pastoral, ecumenical, and evangelizing purpose of the liturgical reform of Vatican II. We have to ask ourselves where the unfamiliarity of the liturgy, what in German uh, Kahneman called the Fremdheit of the liturgy, so the strangeness of the liturgy, if this unfamiliarity serves modern man and women or not, and where this unfamiliarity builds a barrier of unintel unintelligibility between church and modern man and women. For the future of the liturgy and the future of the, of the church, it is indispensable to look at the perspective of others, others in the world of the oikumene and in the world as such. Now, a few words of conclusion. Now, at the end of 2013, the church, I think, is rediscovering again Vatican II. 
because of the anniversary and because of Francis. The debate on Vatican II in the Church of today has gone, I think, in a way back. It's not clear whether it has gone back to the year of the Synod of 1985 or to the very day after the end of the Second Vatican Council on December the 9th, 1965. But I choose 1985 because in that year, Father Robert Taft received the Beraka Award, and in the very memorable lecture he gave on that occasion, there are, among many incredibly interesting passages, there are two passages that I think are, are very telling uh, in light of these last few years in the life of uh, the Church, of what Vatican II is uh, and why it is important for us to rediscover Vatican II in this moment of transition. The first passage concerns ecumenism, and here Father Taft said, <clears throat> I quote, ecumenism is not just a movement, it is a new way of being Christian. It is also a new way of being a scholar. In short, it seeks to move Christian love into the realm of scholarship, and it is the implacable enemy of all forms of bigotry, intolerance, unfairness, selective reporting, and oblique comparisons that contrast the unrealized ideal of one own church with the less than, than ideal reality of someone else's church." End quote. The, the second quote concerns the very idea of ministry in the church, which has, I think, huge consequences for our understanding of uh, uh, the liturgy. And I quote here, every Christian ministry, like that of our Redeemer, is one of reconciliation and service. End quote. Both of these ideas Ecumenism as part of the Christian vocation and ministry in a serving and poor church are part of the path between Vatican II and today. The history of, of the debate on Vatican II is the history, I think, of the successful reception of the Council, but also of, of some question marks. Among these question marks, there is one that concerns the destiny and the future of the post-Vatican II ecumenical liturgical consensus. That is the impact of the liturgical reform of the Council in the world of ecumene and the reception of this impact within the Catholic Church. <clears throat> there is little doubt that the abrupt termination of ISIL uh, by the Vatican is one of the, to say the least, problematic aspects of the present moment, both internally for the church and for ecumenical dialogue. In the passage between Liturgiam Authenticum, 2001, and Anglicanorum Cetibus in 2009, there is a clear relationship be between the Vatican policy about the liturgy and the trajectories of ecumenical relations projected by some in the Catholic leadership. In turn, the debate on Vatican II had clear, consequence, had clear consequences for the internal debate on the implementation of the liturgical reform, since the so-called hermeneutics of continuity in reading Vatican II are essential to the goals of the advocate of the so-called reform of the liturgical reform. But simply put, it is clear that the decisions made in these last few years about the liturgy at the universal and at the national level here in the US do not sustain, a German theologian would, would, would say tragen, they have no power to lift the conditions of existence of the church in a modern and post-modern world. One sure way not to let ecumenism become a, monu a monument to the memory of the 20th century, who is, I think, is 
the recovery of the liturgical reform as the gateway for the whole of Vatican II. If we do not want ecumenism to be monumentalized and sterilized, liturgical theology must consider the ecumenical issue of today in light of the new historical cultural for, uh, framework. And here I'll just mention three things. First, ecumenism and globalization multiculturalism. Second, ecumenism and epistemological tolerance. And third, ecumenism and the issues of justice, peace, and the protection of creation. The liturgical reform of Vatican II is one of the most important, if not the most important reform in the history of modern Catholicism. And we are now, 50 years after Vatican II, at the beginning of the rediscovery of the theological meaning of this reform and of its potential for the future of the church. There are open issues that have to do with the ecumenical nature of the liturgical reform and the new relationship church and modern world and among them especially I have to say the new translation of the liturgical text, liturgical ministries and the role of women in the church and the issue of inculturation. But now, so what happened in these last few months put us in a different situation since the election of Pope Francis on March the 13th, 2013. The neo-exclusivist assault against the Church of Vatican II was brought to an end by the election of a pope who, from the point of view of this church historian, is really the first pope of the post-Vatican II period. It is difficult to keep up with the pace of Pope Francis, and every assessment of the situation of Francis Pontificate ages very rapidly. However, I think that the main coordinates of the pontificate are, are clear now. And especially the liturgical culture of Pope Francis is different, let's say that. For Catholics who still had doubts about this, Pope Francis, in, the, in his interview with the Jesuit magazine that was published in uh, the American magazine in English, made very clear how he sees the liturgical reform. And let me um, conclude with a quotation from, from that interview from Pope Francis. Vatican II produced a renewal movement that simply comes from the same gospel. Its roots are enormous. Just recall the liturgy. The work of the liturgical reform has been a service to the people as a rereading of the gospel from a concrete historical situation. Thank you. <laughs>